Back in Yugoslavia, they built these futuristic, awe-inspiring socialist monuments commemorating the people's liberation struggle during the Second World War. This is one of those monuments. Today we're going to explore a couple of these monuments, talk about why they were built, what their significance is, and talk about what makes them different even from other socialist and communist monuments which commemorate the Second World War. This one here was built in Nikšić, Montenegro in 1987. It stands 20 meters tall. And so today we're gonna see this monument. And after this, we're gonna go up into a nearby valley into the mountains. And we're gonna see another World War II monument here in Montenegro. And we're gonna explore these monuments histories, what they represent, their beauty, and even more. So join me as we begin our formal exploration of these beautiful Yugoslav monuments, better known as Spomeniks. And hopefully along the way, we can talk to some people and see not only what the significance historically is of these monuments, but what they still mean to their communities today. In terms of the art of the monuments, I mean, I'm not really an art person, so I'm not here to tell you what these things represent, but some common themes through all of them is you can see obviously the star there, the five pointed star, which was the symbol of the Yugoslav Communist Party. And some other themes that you can find in all of these monuments, in addition to commemorating the fallen fighters and the victims of fascism all throughout the former Yugoslavia, is this idea of a rebirth and the building of a new country out of the ashes of World War II. Some people say that this is a flower with a bunch of petals. Some people say that it's a gear representing industry. But either way, both of those things can represent the building of a new Yugoslav nation, whether it's the blooming of a flower, whether it's the turning gears of the industry that rebuilt the country. And this one specifically commemorates the 32 partisan fighters who were killed on this hill during the Second World War as the Italians retook the city. So here you can see the names of all of the fighters who were killed, executed, as they tried to escape Nikšić. And in addition to this shape up here, the same shape is found on the bottom with each little spoke or whatever you want to call one of these points here, representing one of the fallen fighters here in Nikšić. And the centerpiece, the Narodi Heroi, the national hero, the most famous of these fallen fighters, was their commander, Chedomir, or better known as Ljubo Čupić. Ljubo Čupić was the leader of this band of partisans who were executed by Italian soldiers as they tried to escape. Your heroism will be celebrated by generations for centuries to come. And finally, the last thing before we go, 1941 to 1945, of course, the years of the Second World War. All right, well, now we're gonna head over and find a bus or more likely a van up to the Župa Nikšićka Valley where there's another Spomenik and even a monastery. And uh, the Spomenik is kind of tied to the monastery and we'll talk about that as we go. So now let's quickly talk about the background of World War II here in Yugoslavia, just to kind of set up the story of why a lot of these uh, Spomeniks were built. World War II was obviously the worst event that's ever happened globally. I mean, the untold amounts of evil, the untold amounts of fighting, not to mention the innocent civilians that were killed, the Holocaust, terrible things all around the world during World War II. And Yugoslavia was no exception to that. Some might say that in Yugoslavia, it was even worse than in a lot of other places. 
And one thing that made Yugoslavia unique, in addition to the atrocities that were committed here, was they also had the most badass resistance force, which was the partisans. So you had all kinds of armed resistance groups. You had the Chetniks, who were kind of Serb nationalists, which were left over from the Yugoslav military. And then you had the partisans, which was made up mainly by the Communist Party of Yugoslavia and led by Tito, Josip Broz Tito. And uh, he would obviously become the leader of Yugoslavia after World War II. Sorry for the spoils. So in 1941, Montenegro, Slovenia, and some other smaller areas were incorporated into Italy or were, were at least controlled by Italy to some degree. And so in 1941, the Italian troops came into Nikšić and they took the city as they did with the rest of Montenegro. And within weeks, these groups, the Chetniks and the Partisans started to spring up. And over the summer of 1941, just a couple of months after the city of Nikšić had been taken and Montenegro had been taken over by the Italians, the resistance started and the Chetniks and the Partisans, for the most part working together at that point, were able to liberate the city of Nikšić. And so over the summer of 1941, the city was actually liberated from the Axis forces, and a lot of Montenegro was as well. However, then came in late 1941 and early 1942, a crackdown by the Axis powers. And it was during that point that the Chetniks, at least in Montenegro, switched sides and began working with the Axis forces. And now, of course, it's always more complicated than that. Like, I'm just talking about Nikšić specifically, you had places where the Chetniks were working with the Partisans, you had places where they were collaborating with the Axis, and I understand that it's more complicated than how I'm laying it out here, but in Nikšić specifically, the Chetniks worked with the Italians to drive the Partisans out of the city. And it was during this point where the Partisans were almost entirely kicked out of Montenegro, and they were driven out of Nikšić, and it was while they were fleeing the city in 1942 that that massacre of 32 partisan fighters happened. Uh, as they were fleeing, they were captured by the Axis, they were rounded up, and then they were executed back on that hill over there. And here is apparently the site of the execution itself, where 29 Yugoslav fighters were killed by the Italian army, executed as they attempted to flee up this hill and out of Nikšić. And this little monument here was built in 1952. Of course, a lot of flowers around here commemorating those fallen fighters. And then in 1987, 35 years later, they built this beautiful monument, 20 meters tall, overlooking this field and one of the major uh, cemeteries of Nikšić. I'm not gonna be able to read this word for word, but it basically says that uh, in this spot, the Italian occupiers and their Chetnik ally collaborators in 1942, on the 29th of June, they killed 29 Yugoslav fighters for the national liberation who heroically fell for the liberation and the happy future of our people. Beautiful. And then after this crackdown happened and the partisans were executed and driven out of Montenegro, well, they crossed up into Bosnia. And once they were in Bosnia, then they were kind of surrounded on all sides in the Susjetka, I think I'm pronouncing that right, the Susjetka River Valley. And at this point, things were looking very bleak for the partisans as they were in Bosnia, in this river valley, their future was uncertain at best. And that's a perfect segue into the next monument that we'll see up in the Župa Nikšićka Valley, because that monument is dedicated to the Battle of Susjetka, which would end up being one of the most famous battles in Yugoslavia in World War II. And movies would be made about it and monuments would be dedicated to it as the monument that we're gonna go see up in the valley. So let us get a van up there and uh, that's that. Let's go find some transport. By the way, I want to say I love the Montenegrin flag. It's got a two-headed eagle or a two-headed bird on it. And even though it's not as iconic as the Albanian two-headed bird, it is still a 
pretty badass flag. Whenever you have a two-headed bird, I feel like it's going to be a good flag. And here you have it, guys. Nikšić. A city of about just under 60,000 people, which makes it just smaller by a few thousand than my city of Utica. So roughly the same size. Now that monument back there was pretty easy to get to. I just had to walk from my apartment this morning, 20 minutes and I was there. It's a nice Yugoslav fountain here in the park. However, I'm guessing that this next monument is gonna be a little bit harder to get to, but I guess we'll find out here. And this guy here, Sava Kovacevic, remember his name. He actually died in the Battle of Susietka. And he is gonna be the centerpiece of our video tomorrow. We're gonna to go to this guy's hometown, Sava Kovacevic. Yugoslav hero. Zdravo. Trajim pevoz za Župa Monastir. Ok, ovamo. Hvala. Zdravo, a željeznička stanica, gdje je to? Željeznička stanica pije. Lijevo i samo pičeš pravo. Ok, ekstra, hvala. Bravo, izvinite. Uh, treba mi prevoz do Župa Monastir. Sam ti Ok, on. Znaš li u koliko sati je sljedeće? 12 i 15. 12 i 15. Ok, super, hvala. Sounds like we just missed the van, but there's another one in 30 minutes. So let's get a bite to eat. Let's get some lunch. The clouds are starting to roll in. It is supposed to rain today. But hopefully it doesn't affect us today. Dobar dan. Samo jedan s mesom burek, molim. It hurts my heart to say the words sa mesom burek. Burek already has meat. Ne postoji burek sa sirom. Sirnica. Well guys, the good news is I got some burek and some crackers. But the bad news is it has started to rain. So hopefully that will not hinder our adventure. Well guys, it turns out we could have been waiting on the bus the whole time. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty wet, but good thing we got this good raincoat. So yeah, we're gonna take this bus up into the Jupa Valley. It is pouring rain, so hopefully we can stay as dry as possible up there. Hopefully it doesn't become a thunderstorm. And we're off. A little bit of rain is not gonna stop us from seeing a Skomenik. Jupa uh, Monastir. Jupa Monastir. Hvala. I kako da plaćem? Da sad što s kolega. Aha. Well, it's a much different setting up here than it was in Nikšić. We've come up into the mountains, the famous mountains of Montenegro, and for now, the rain has let up. Let us knock on some wood here. Boom, boom, boom. And here you can see it's the, oh God, I can't read that. Sveti, Sveti, what is that first letter? But it's uh, the Luke, Luke, Luca is the uh, the saint. So it's St. Luke's Monastery. I don't know what the second word is. I don't know what that first letter is. Is it Apostol? Okay, it's it's an A. Apostol, Sveti, Apostol, Luca, Jupa. And Jupa is the valley that we're in here. 450 meters this way. You can see it up there. 
And as well as the monastery, I used the monastery as a landmark because probably more people would come to see that than would come to see this, which is the Spomenik. And I've seen now a lot of photos of Spomeniks, and this is one of my favorite ones, just in terms of the look of it. But, but first, I'll set the stage. Uh, I'll pick up where I left off in the story. After the partisans were driven out of Montenegro in 1942, they went up to the north in Bosnia. And one of the major partisan brigades from Montenegro was the 5th Proletariat um, Brigade from Montenegro, and that was from this area. I think the 6th was as well, because my hotel was on the 6th Brigade something street. And you had this guy, Sava Kovacevic, who commanded this 5th Brigade, which had roughly a thousand fighters, men and women. The partisans were famous for having women fighters as well. Obviously mostly men, but there were some women in there. And they escaped to the north, up into southern Bosnia. And then they had this battle in the valley of Susjetka. And Tito led the partisans through the valley of Susjetka, and they were kind of surrounded. And so they made this daring escape, but they had to go right through the Axis lines. And in doing so, they lost a ton of fighters. So many fighters were lost in the Battle of Susjetka, but Tito escaped, and many other fighters did too. And so they lived to fight another day. And obviously we know how that ended. There would be a partisan resurgence in 1943 and 1944, and then the country would be fully liberated in 1945, mostly by the partisans and then by the Red Army of the USSR as well. And in this valley, there were eight fighters who were killed in that Battle of Susjetka. Of the nearly 1,000 fighters in the 5th Brigade from Montenegro, over half of them were killed in that battle, which just shows you how bloody of an affair it was. And eight of those fighters who passed away were from here, from uh, this Jupa Valley. And a lot of people from this valley joined the partisan ranks at different points during the war. And so the Italian occupiers, they got fed up with it. And in 1943, they came up into the valley and they came to this monastery, which is one of the focal points of the valley, of the culture and of the history. It was built in the 13th century, almost 800 years ago. They heavily damaged it. They burnt books, they burnt records because they were fed up with the people from the valley joining the ranks of the partisans. And then finally, the partisans made their resurgence in 1944. They came back and they liberated almost all of Montenegro, including this valley, which was finally liberated in November of 1944, about six months before the end of the war. And 40 years later, in 1984, some veterans from the Jupa Valley decided that they should commemorate the damage of the monastery the sacking of the valley, which obviously this was the, the main focal point of that, and the liberation of the valley. And so in 1984, they built this. And this commemorates the eight fallen fighters from the Jupa Valley. This one is not as big as the one that we saw down in Nikšić. This one is 11 meters tall, so just under half the height, but it's still quite imposing. And to be honest, it's bigger than it looks in photos. And here's the plaque commemorating the fighters who fell. It's very hard to read this, but this is dedicated to the eight fallen fighters from the Jupa Valley. And you can see here their names. I mean, you have 25 years old, a 16 year old fighter. Radoja Mirko Buchkovic was 16 years old, 18 years old, 22. And all of these people died in the Battle of Susjetka in 1942. And now this monument is here so that we may remember them even still today. And you can see again, you have the star on top the symbol of Yugoslav socialism, 1941 to 1945, although the one and the nine have fallen off. And if I'm not mistaken, there should be eight points on this sculpture. So let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
Eight, yeah. So there's eight points. One for each of the fighters that was killed. Another thing that I like is they built it on this big platform so that when you're down here, it's even more imposing. So even though the structure itself is only 11 meters tall, from down here, it's pretty high up. After the Second World War, as many of you will know, Yugoslavia kind of separated itself from the other Eastern Bloc communist states. And that was because after the Second World War, leading up to about 1948, Tito and Stalin, leaders of Yugoslavia and the USSR, they had a falling out. And so Yugoslavia really wanted to make itself distinct from the other socialist and communist states. Some of that was in the way that the country itself was managed. It was a bit more liberal than some of the other communist states, allowing more freedom in terms of businesses. But in all aspects of life, Yugoslavia wanted to make themselves distinct from the other communist countries. And so part of that is that they set up the non-aligned movement with a lot of Arab and African states and countries from Asia too. And that was kind of seen as an alternative between the Western capitalist societies and the Eastern communist societies. And since that reached into every aspect of life, they also wanted it to reach into the architecture and the art. And so that's why in Yugoslavia, they also wanted to make their war memorials distinct. And so for a few years after the war, they kind of took on the Soviet style of realism, mosaics and you know, statues of people and the workers and the fighters who won the Second World War ultimately. But as time went on and they wanted to create a distinction between themselves and the Soviet Union, well, they also started building more abstract sculptures, more abstract and distinct war memorials. And that's how you end up getting these unique shapes. And as we'll see, as we explore more of these in the future, they really are unique. You know, now it's been exactly 40 years since this monument was built. And it still looks futuristic today. Some say it looks like a spaceship. Some say it looks like a tree. I don't know. I can't really tell you much about the symbolism of it, but it is beautiful. I'll tell you that. And now you have graffiti on it. Ironically, this symbol here is a symbol of Serb nationalism. What would Tito have said? if you could see the graffiti on this monument. Of course, Tito wasn't even alive anymore when this monument was built, but he was alive when many of them were built. Now I'd like to go and check out the monastery. Hopefully we can take a peek. Dobar dan. Je li okay da pogledam malo? I mogu li slikati isto? Je li okay da slikam malo? Okay, hvala. So I've gotten the okay to film on the outside as long as I don't film any of the sisters and I wasn't supposed to be filming in there so I didn't film too much. This is really beautiful. So this I'm guessing was all built relatively recently, rebuilt. Let's see if this sign says anything. So this complex was built in 1253. All of its stones were built by hand or put there by hand. It doesn't say anything about the Second World War on here, I will say. But it does look like it was rebuilt in from 1981 to 1986. So this has been the monastery. They're not super keen on me filming around, so I'm not going to stick around too long. I really like the way that this one just suits the landscape. It almost feels like a tree. 
It's just one tree among many. And it's starting to rain again. I'm gonna go stand next to it so you can get a sense of the scale. Just keep in mind that I'm very tall. Where's the spool mini? And now it's time to explore a Montenegrin village. This is a proper village up here. So let's see how the Montenegrin villagers treat us today. Nothing like a futuristic monument with an imposing mountain behind it. So yeah, here you go, St. Luke's Monastery, built in 1235, religious center of the area. I don't think that they got the English right on this, but Vise puta je rušen i obnavljan. So yeah, uh, many times it was destroyed and rebuilt. It was formed down several times. If you're watching this and you're working for the St. Luke's Monastery, maybe you mean torn down, destroyed. Other than that, like pretty good English. But uh, yeah, I mean, you guys are doing good. Keep focusing on the monastery. Don't worry about the English. People should learn Montenegrin anyways. All right, well, let's check out this little village over here. This is the road we took up on the bus from Nikšić. It was like a 12 year old kid driving that car. Am I crazy? That kid was 12 years old. There is a 12 year old child driving that car over there. Holy smokes. Oh, now he's speeding away. I wonder if he's in trouble. What the hell? <laughs> 12 year olds on the road here in Montenegro. Wow. Super, I'm a tourist. Uh, I'm a tourist. 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 I'm a Jeli znate malo od uh, spomenik? Jesam. Aha, yes. šta znate? Jer ja sam iskreno došao sam da ja, vidim. Ja si ne dolje onaj na atpis, ono poginuli da, da. dobrovolja. Sam. Ono je taj, je treba spomenik na sve župe, gore na mačak. Međutim, tada je se mijenjalo, te dođi ona vlast, te dođi ona i onda su ga baš dođe. Pa nije pravilo ono iz kopu srpe. Aha. Nije trebalo reći. Ako ima polju, on će se zadnjiš na vrati gore, E, da popiješ kavu kod mene. Aha. Ka, o, ako ćeš, ćeš tamo ponovo u manastiru ili gdje se planira? Pa nemam plan iskreno. I, moj plan bilo je čekati autobus i vratiti al, uh, do Nikšić, ali nemam planovi. Ja ćeš kaj da vidimo koliko ima sati i da te veće... Ja sam baš planira, on je počeo da pada. Ovo mi je prato trice, ona... Pere auto, no. Oh, I'm going to go to the 
Ili ne? Stres mi je, ima jedan Filipo, ja sam Filipović. A oni su tamo od Jugovića, isto od našega vrasta. A jedan ovdje stres mi je na kolak poginu. Kao dobrovoljac, on nije ima 18-19 godina. I on je opuće pritukla da je bio ranjen. Naišao na njega, on bio četnik, ovaj Vlaković i ubio. Onda je jedna djevojka, ženska, vidjela gdje su ih skranjivali, razumiješ, gdje su ih u ledinu kopali. I otud od ovdje saznala se posle jedno, dva, tri mjeseca. Ode mi otac i ova dva brata, dva brata Mostrica. I nađu ga. I nađe ga moj otac kad su plonkali. On kako je staja kod ono keljana, ne znam ti poznato, plonke, udari ga, tune i izbije mu dva zuba. Vau, vaš otac? E, ne. E, brat u stricu, brat u stricu. Izbije mu dva zuba i on samo pogleda, nema dva zuba, ovo je. Vau. Potome ga je na kva. I kad je bilo toga? To je bilo neđe 41-42. I koji godina vi ste rođan? Ja, ja. 53. godine. Vaš otac, šta je radio u drugog svetog rata? Drugog svetog rata. Vaš otac, on je bio ovdje? On je bio ovdje, bio i u brigadu, poslije je bio u zemljoradničku, u Zadu. Aha, u Zagreb? Zadar? U Zadruga, Zadruga. Zadruga, ok. Bila je ona zemljoradnicka Zadruga. Aha. Tu si mora po demisi da kopali, plaćali, davali su. Aha, razumijem. Pa on je bio pravo partizan? I partizan, da. Onda je poslije na jezero, mala je bila dosta pezija, ono ima 30% ima učešće i rat. Nego samo učešće u ratu, u brigade je bio i te, razumijem. I onda se njima kad je penzija bila, 30% su uvećavali na taj iznos penzije. 30%. Šta rade ljudi u Dolina za posao, na primjer? Šta je industrija, recimo, ovdje? Najviše zemlja, recimo, krompi. Drže, kosi se livada, drže kranu, poneko drži i ovce, oni koji drži i ovce, oni ide na katune, ima one kolibe, te smo zvali ranijeve, sad neko ima i vikenda izreda. Vi hranite Crne Gora, naroda Crne Gora, ok. Ali je hrana zdrava, stvarno, što se tiče kvaliteta hrane, da je najzdravije. Aha, da, da, to je važno. Tako vi živite dugo život. Imate li djecu? Imam tri sina i širku. Aha, i džesu? Jedan je u Budvu, a jedan je u Herceg-Novi, a ovi je ođe u Nikšiću. U Nikšiću. A sjerka mi radi u bolnicu. Ođe u našu, na dječku. U Nikšić ili? U Nikšić. A, ovdje. Pa svi su još u Crnogoru? Imaju oni dinar svoj, pa eto. Svi su pripadaju u Crnogoru. A, pa super. Nije često da pričam s nekim i... Kaže da njegov cinovi i čerke još su u Balkanu. Nije često. Pa to je dobar, to je dobar. Ja sam kopao ujemu po zemljom da zaradim dinar. Otac mi je kopao u zadruge, držali su u živo, izdisali, na leđe je nosio, sijeno i... Lis, mi smo to zvali lis, onu šumu, da se dadne ovcama i govedima. Nemalo se, nije imalo nikakva primanja, tada je nema. Ma ima da skolje ovcu. Ali kovali su kartvolu kad nije bilo, ono, krompir, ja, nikak to je. Lijeba nema, jedino žitu, kukuru, sijali i ono, e, i viđi. I zadovoljni su bili i zdravi i svijet. Mora, već kad ga je Bog stvorio. Mora da se bori za život. Da se bori i brat. Da se bori? Šta znači? Da se bori za život. Znači da misli šta će raditi, 
капаючи далі будучність свою, зивотну, розумієш, а не само лежи о вогону і місле не втечі до очі, само не море само до очі, ніщо, ніщо не море само до очі. Мора чоловік бути упоран за все. Треба ж радити, треба ж... Е, е, то, е, то, зато се река, значи, борба за живот. Борба за живот, да, 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 да. Борба за живот. А чуєш, ако имаш волю да пієш каву, сад ќе рече овој продавач, да ти стави каву да попиє. Само да ти стави каву да попиє. Само да ти стави каву да попиє. Па ќе се пиј ојде пити и да попиє сок или пиво, што волиш да попиј. Не значи сок од трговина? Има. Има. Па то је окей, да, да. Ајмо сад таман, да видим овај... И да ја рече, рече а таа е добар се ја сони во продавач само. А очеш сок? Сок и ви. И па има и во табираш кој ќе. Аха. Ја хочеме на на пива. Јален Никшичко. Има ли тубор да тај? Тубор. А дај овај. А да да има има има. Ја чу Никшичко, ќер, па ми смо о Никшич. Да, оли каду, да, да, да. Ова е американец, мама. Како сте? Из Америке. Дошла и се од мана сира убила си ја. И ја случај ноќе во Ферово. Ја хоцете нешто друго? Ништо, во. Идеме саде тамо да се димо и да пием. Ова, ова лама. Ја има ти нешто за отворено. Пала. Hvala vama, prijatno. Pa živio. Trebam vas pitati ovaj, ovaj pitanje. Pa ima jedan, ne znam kako se kaže na vaš jezik, stereotype koji je, kažu da u Crnogoru volite spavati. Pa ješto, i ni veliki ne radi, si neće niko, znaš ko najviše radi, recimo generacije moje koje su zdrave i mlađe od mene, možda jedno deset godina. E tu možda ću, a ovo mlađe, samo gleda da... Da, da. A znaš kako su rekli, to je jedan kao vic, što se reče. Kane Crnogorac dođe ka zrenu jabuke, leže pod jabuku i gleda u jabuku i da mu plane jabuka mora tjede i da uzme, da je ne bere, nego da je uzme ležeći da je jede. Čeka da plane jabuka, a leži i pod jabuku. A ba da je to kao malo izmislio. Pa nikad niste cijeli otići od Crnogoru, živite u drugo država. Ne, ješam ono po nedelju dana, deset dana. Jedna mi je sestra u Vrbaš, u Vojvodini bila u dana. Aha, aha, Vojvodina. Onda rodem pe šest dana, deset. Odem i na more po pe šest dana. Da. Ali ovako od užeg ne. Al, ne, ne. Ok, ok. Jer ovo je, ovo je kuć. Ovo je hom, kod vas. Mora da čovjek daje i stan i da bi daje, ne znam, što sve bi to bilo kratko vrijeme, možda bi to trajalo mjesec, dva dana, dalje ne bi. Ja, to je to. Ej, je, ovo ja sjedim okom amerikanca, sjedim. Drinking Montenegrin beer with a legendary Montenegrin man. That's as good as it gets. Come to the former Yugoslavia, learn the language, and the rest is taken care of for you. These are the kinds of experiences you can have. You can come and look at Spomeniks and drink beer with Montenegrin villagers. Look at that. The Župa Valley, beautiful place with monasteries and spomeniks and nice old Yugoslav men who like to drink beer. And his dad was a partisan. 
He fought against the oppression of the Italians and helped to free this valley. Ah, what a nice place. What a beautiful, peaceful place. There's nothing better than that feeling at the end of a video when it's been a success. We found the monuments we wanted to find. We talked to some people. And I'm a little bit filled with alcohol. Come to Montenegro. Here you go. All right. The hitchhiking begins. Are we going to succeed? Let us see here. This is going to work out. First car. Go. No. Kako vam se sviđa Crna Gora, život u Crna Gora? Mala je zemlja i nikšić je na dobroj poziciji. Da. Za sat vremena si do mora, za sat vremena si do planine. To ima prednost, znaš to. Da, da, da. Well, guys. I felt like that was a job interview or something. I guess they were curious, I don't know. Maybe they don't talk to a lot of Americans, they probably don't. Um, but yeah, that was fun. Nice people here in Montenegro. The hospitality is real. And that was crazy, the first car that came by, one for one. That is the um, highest success rate that I've ever had in a country hitchhiking. So there you go. And so to wrap things up, What's the true meaning of these spomeniks? Why do they matter? Are they really more than just some abstract shapes of concrete scattered around the various cities, rural landscapes, mountains of Yugoslavia? Well, of course it depends on who you ask. The true answer is that all of these spomeniks tell a different story. I mean, we just saw the one in Nikšić and then the one up here in Jupa Valley and they tell two different but related stories about the Second World War here in Yugoslavia. At the most basic level, they commemorate the fighters who died, the eight fighters from Jupa, or the 32 fighters from Nikšić who were killed in battle. And in that way, they each tell their own story. However, as a whole, the Spomeniks tell another story. Obviously, they tell a geopolitical story. The split between Tito and Stalin is part of what gave them their unique shapes. In many ways, these sculptures represent where Yugoslavia was geopolitically, which is obviously a socialist state, building socialist monuments and architecture, but also with some Western ideals like liberalism, which are displayed in this modernist design. There's the ever-present theme of the defeat of fascism in the Second World War, one of the greatest evils that this earth has ever seen, and the badass fighters that came together and made that happen. And another theme that connects all these spomeniks, and my personal favorite theme, is the theme of a new beginning. A lot of them are shaped like plants or flowers, spaceships, if you will, all of which represent the nation of Yugoslavia that was built from the ashes of the Second World War and of a bright future for that Yugoslav nation for decades and centuries to come. And even though that country is now a thing of the past, these monuments are still here representing the same ideas that they always have. And hopefully they'll continue to inspire people for generations to come. It's been a pleasure to explore these two Spomeniks and there will be plenty more Spomenik adventurizing and general former Yugoslav adventurizing in the months to come. And also, tell me what these monuments mean to you if you were born in Yugoslavia or you grew up in the former Yugoslavia. Do they mean anything to you or are they just stupid pieces of concrete which represent a bygone era? Anyways, whatever they mean to you, they're pretty cool. So as always, thank you for watching and follow me on Instagram. I'm trying to get more followers. And have a good day.